Turn your Bibles with me. Six, uh, and I want to share a message with you that I preached almost 20 years ago, and it kept running through my mind, and uh, I, I found the old notes that I'd had from it, and I started out with that, and I kind of veered away, so um, we uh, kind of will make this the wrap-up of the series that we've been doing for the last six weeks that I may know him. And um, we, we've talked about that I may know his salvation, that I may know his will. And today I, I want you, to, I want to preach a message to you about the most important thing that we can do for the Lord, and that is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you'll stand to your feet now, Brother Allen, we're at uh, Matthew chapter 6. Stand to your feet in the honor of reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 33. Let me have it over here, Danny, please. I'm needing that. Thank you. You'll know why I lose your reward. Good job, Matt. Therefore I say unto you, we need a mic. Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body. What ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add (coughs) one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I want us to all read verse 33 together with Alan. Go ahead, Alan. But seek Seek ye first the kingdom kingdom of God and his his righteousness, righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. you. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his word. Father, for the next few minutes, help us to recollect what we've studied. And God, I pray to clear up our voice, whatever's going on there. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children said, you may be seated. Thank you, Brother Allen. I want to speak to you for a few minutes on that verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I submit to you that here today, all of us have battles with seeking first the kingdom of God. It is natural to seek first our belly when we're hungry, to seek first money when we need some money. But I want you to know that we need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things be added to you. Those of you who are here Wednesday night had a good laugh with me and Sharon. By the way, Sharon's with her friend and her daughter and uh, they're back to Knoxville and they'll be back tonight. Sharon will be here. But I want to share with you something. How many was here Wednesday night? Raise your hand. I owned a Harley Davidson motorcycle the shortest amount of time in the history of Smith Brothers Harley. I bought one Tuesday, wrote a check for it, went back Wednesday, told him I want my money back. And he said, why? I said, I had to choose between a Harley and a wife, and I chose the latter. But we, we joked about it, and Sharon told me it's your decision. How many of you guys know when your wife says, it's your decision, honey? She really don't mean that. And so and after she told me it was her decision, listen, there's an honest man already getting fussed at. I'm telling you what, bless his heart. Try to be honest, and what does he get? <clears throat> but... Uh, my wife is a nurse, and she told me it was my decision, and then she started telling me about all the people that she'd seen in the hospital. 
with motorcycle accidents. And so, and then we started going over, and your name come up, Eddie, you can't ride. But anyway, all, all these things come up. But I want to tell you what the truth of the matter was. I didn't have any peace about it financially. Because I was going to have to do two things. I was going to have to knock the whiz out of my savings account, and then I was going to have to borrow money to pay for the rest. And I never, I never did ask God about that. I just saw something I want. I mean, it, you know, when you got legs as short as me and you find a motorcycle, your feet will fit flat on the ground. It's oh happy day. I mean, they had a hundred motorcycles there. They was one that I loved that my feet would sit on the ground. <laughs> but I didn't seek God for it. And that's not the first time. And I'm hate to say it won't be the last time. I certainly hope that most of the time I ask his will first. God, guys, no matter what we do, whether it's a purchase we make or it's a, a, a who we marry, who we date, uh, where we work, where we go to college, all of those things, God has a plan for your life. You say that don't matter to God. Everything about you matters to God. I heard a, a pastor one time say, there's some things don't matter to God. That's as silly as anything I ever, everything matters to God. The Bible said he clothes the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. If he's that, uh, has that kind of attention to detail, don't you think that he cares where you and I work for a living? He's got a place for us to be. People come to me all the time and say, don't you pray to get another job? Why? I work with a bunch of sinners. Good. You know, this is church. Uh, we're, we're supposed to have a bunch of, but it's good to be able to work where you can share. Now, I know occasionally we get somebody that you want to kill them and tell God they're dead. I understand that. But uh, by and large, we need to be in the world where we can do something to help. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It is easy spiritually. It is much more difficult in the flesh. My flesh has got an agenda as does yours. But I want you to know, you will be happy if you find out what God wants you to do at any part of life and walk therein you'll have contentment peace joy happiness you'll have that but if you want to do something like i did i wanted to buy that motorcycle and have god to rubber stamp that that was okay god this is what i want and it did not work out so it took me till today from wednesday to come clean with the whole story you see not all you guys ride motorcycles and wayne i want you to know wayne sigmund is one of the kindest men i've ever met and when I told Wayne this, he said, you reckon your wife's going to let you have your man card back anytime soon? <coughs> and, and I want you to know, Wayne, that didn't go unnoticed. But I want to give you three, three quick examples, and I hope they'll be a blessing to you today. Amen? Number one, seek him first in our finances. That's a biggie. Number two, I don't even know where I've done number two. Seek God first in the use of our gifts and talents. And thirdly, and most importantly, seek him with all of our heart. First, seek the Lord in our finances. God has made us the most prosperous nation on the planet. Yet those blessings seemingly take up most of our time and thought rather than God does. Are you with me? It it takes up more of our thought process. It takes up more of our time. It takes up more of our energy. It's taking, it's no, it's not a problem to have money as long as money don't have you. You get that? It's okay to have a new car as long as that new car don't have you. One of the worst things we do is live above our means. Can somebody say amen? God blesses us by and large so we can bless others. How many times have you ever seen somebody in need? I mean, really in need. And you thought, man, I wish I had something that I could bless those people with. But we don't. You know, you're not going to probably, if you've got a raise and got a bigger raise, you probably wouldn't live a whole lot better if you're not taking care of whatever you've got now. Can somebody say amen? One of the reasons is, first, many Christians are living under a curse. Uh, and it's hard to operate under God's curse. The Bible said in Malachi 3 and 8, Will a man rob God? Now this is the Bible. This ain't Donnie. Yea, you have robbed me, but you say, Wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. And then he says, you're cursed with the curse where you've robbed me. Man, it's getting quiet now. You can talk about anything in a Baptist church you want to. You talk about George Washington, all hell breaks loose. Somebody say amen. Bring you the tithes into the storehouse, the Bible said, and give to the Lord. 
A lot of people give their tithes. They say, well, I got a kid that's having a rough time. I give my tithes to them. You're teaching that child wrong. I've got a mother sick. I'm giving my tithes to her. That's all the Bible said. The Bible said bring your tithes in and the rest of the money you help others out. Can you say amen on that? And it's not one of the things that River of Life has frustrated me through the years. We have such a powerful spirit in this church and we have people shouting on credit every blessed Sunday. You brother, I don't like the way you're talking. Did you know Jesus talked about as much money, about as much thing? You know why? Because he knew the importance it had to us. What can you do without money? And I believe in having a little money. I believe in saving money. You, somebody said, I'm broke as convict and I'm happy as I can be. I'm not happy when I'm broke. I like to have a dollar or two swishing around my pocket. My brother-in-law, Dan, I first met him, said, money won't buy happiness, but it'll take you downtown where happiness is, you know. <laughs> but I, I believe <clears throat> that God wants to bless us so that we can have and give. I will tell you that I write checks every month. We have to pay bills just like you do. But my favorite check that I get to write every month is to the River of Life Church. And, and there's other things we do. We try to help with missions. We try to help with, with kids. And Sharon's got two or three things that she does for children and, and, and all that. But God will bless you above measure. I'd rather have 90% of my money with God's blessing than rob him with 100%. You say, well, I've got a lot of money. Who's it going to be when you leave here? You know, what's your legacy going to be? Mom and Dad left us a lot of money. Now we've been to fight for two years over the estate. Holly and I have been selling real estate lately, and Holly just got in with one that, uh, or she, I don't know if she's done with it now, but I had one where somebody I, I've never seen. Do you know how hard 11 kids can fight over $40,000? $40,000, 11 children, it was a nightmare. Five of them had died. Guess what that done? That gave us 12 more to fight. Now we got 23 people, and I spent a year and a half running down people, begging them to sign off so we could sell the property. Sometimes the worst thing we can do for our kids is give them a lot of money. I want to tell you something that, I, that hit me like a ton of brick the other day. My children had it a lot better than I did. They had more stuff than I did. Uh, they done better. My I done better than my daddy. Uh, my daddy had more than my grandfather. And here's what we always say. I want my children to have it better than I did. Well, what was wrong with the way we had it? We learned work ethic. I learned if I wanted something, I had to work for it. I couldn't go in and say, Pap, I need this. My daddy didn't have it. And if he did have it, he wouldn't have gave it to me. I learned to work. I learned, and I was watching the football life the other night and I saw Jerry Rice, who's probably the greatest receiver that ever zipped up a, or put on a pair of a pads in his life. And he said the one thing he loved about his daddy, his daddy's a brick mason. My daddy taught me to work. He was catching brick when he was 12 years old. And he said he believed the reason he caught everything stowed at him. When you're trying to catch two or three brick at a time, them things rough, your hands rough. He said to his his coach in the pros, first time he seen him, he said, you got the roughest hands I've ever seen. And you know these guys, a lot of them wear gloves. Jerry Rice most of the time just went with his hand. His dad taught him to work. One of the great, I don't know how I got off on that. One of the greatest blessings you can do your children is teach them how to work. Somebody say amen. amen. Secondly, we ought to seek God first in how we spend what he does give us. Yeah, amen. amen. Boy, it's quiet. <clears throat> you know, I love Brother John. It's the first time I ever heard him say anything about me. <laughs> we often get in financial messes, and I've counseled people through all of them that we put ourselves in. And we live above our means. If you seek God first and have contentment, that stuff will be behind you. You don't have to have a new car every three years. You know, if you're living in a 2,000 square foot house, and you and your wife, you don't need 6,000. We built a house several years ago, 6,500 square feet for a 78-year-old man and his wife. Junior, you see it all the time. People live in houses as big as this church is 80 years old. The only benefit I can see when you get in a fight, you could get in one end of it and her to get in the other end, and it might be peaceful. I don't know. I'd put one bedroom, one end of that joint, and one on the other. I, again, I love to see people have. But I don't want to see stuff have us. Another thing is we try to keep up the Joneses. The problem is we keep up the Joneses. They build a bigger house, buy a new car, and we got to go again. Or the Joneses are in debt up the up. Have y'all ever seen that commercial where a guy's riding that blonde morning? He goes, I have a 5,000 square foot house. I have a new car and I have a new truck. And he's just smiling. He said, I have two kids in college. Want to know how I do it? I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. 
A lot of truth in that. Oh, praise the Lord. If I'm going by hateful faces, about half of you hate me right now, and about half is really enjoy. <laughs> Man, I never seen so many. Either that or some people still got some stomach stuff left over from this thing. You know. But the Bible said, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet his wife, his manservant, his maidservant, nor anything that belongeth to thy neighbor. What causes covetousness? Jealousy. Amen. Discontent. I've seen people in their families, if I, 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 I'm telling this, this will go out on the internet. If you watch this, ma'am, I'm sorry it hurts your feelings. I'm not going to tell your name. But Junior, I worked for Junior Britt <clears throat> off and on a couple of, a couple of years there, several years ago. And I don't know if you remember or not, Junior, but we went to a house in Roundtree. And that house sold $450,000. And when I found out what the couple, both of them, done for a living, I thought, how on earth can they afford this? And about a year later, Junior took me back over and we, make, we fixed it up a little bit because they'd foreclosed on that house. $450,000. They could probably afford it, a $220,000, $230,000 house. Junior, you've done some as You probably don't remember this, but it sticks out in my mind. What I found out later was her, do- her sister was a doctor and her brother was a doctor and they lived right up the street in a $600,000 house. So they wanted to try to, to impress them on a fifth of the salary. Now this couple's credit was ruined. Uh, the bank could sue them for the difference. And here's the bad part, Junior, I found out later on. They borrowed 125% of the appraised value of that house. Y'all with me? In the car business, that's called being upside down. What happened? Poor, poor management and stewardship. Here's the bottom line. Every one of us, whether you make 10 bucks an hour or 50 bucks an hour, whether you've got a million dollars in your IRA or like me, a few thousand, here's the difference. I mean, here's where we're all like. Everything I've got comes from God. I'm a steward. People say, I can do what I want to with my money. You can, but you're not pleasing God and you do that. You're not pleasing God when we do that. We're stewards of what God has given us, guys. He's and, and, and the deal is, the deal is, we're going to be judged on it someday. And, and you think you're uncomfortable now. This is just a little old fat country preacher that messes up all the time. Wait till you stand before God. You say, I'm not going to stand before God. You'll stand before the beam and judgment seat, and you'll give account of every deed done in the flesh, whether it be evil or good. Somebody say Amen. amen. <clears throat> Philippians 4 and 11 says not that I speak in respect to want for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content I know how to be abased I know how to abound everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me Amen. Hebrews thirteen five said let your conversation be without covenants. I want to tell you about two or three people and I'll try to move on. The Bible said in Proverbs 15, 16, better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. And before you start and the devil tells you, Brother Donnie, just trying to give a, get more money to this church, I'll just tell you, yes I am. So he can get more money. I haven't had a raise in 12 years. I've turned down four or five. I took a thousand dollar a year, twelve hundred dollar a year pay cut last year because we was having trouble meeting the missions. Ask anybody on board directors and they'll tell you. You say, are you bragging? No, I'm not bragging. I'm telling you, if you if you make forty thousand years, what y'all pay me and you spend thirty one thousand dollars a year, you can save nine thousand. Is anybody with me? But if you if you make forty thousand, you spend forty five thousand. Sooner or later, it's going to catch up with you. I don't care if Trump's in the White House. I don't care who's in the White House. Sooner or later, that twenty trillion dollar duck is going to come home to roost. Mike, am I telling the truth? Sooner or later, the debt is going to catch us, and we'll all have to pay for it. Probably all those IRAs we've been saving all these years. But the I want to tell you about a couple of people. My daddy was, I think, the best Christian man I was ever around all the time. Walter Van Hoy is right there. But my daddy was raised in a log house. And daddy said, Sonny, it wasn't nothing. We woke up in the morning for snow to be. How many, is there anybody here that'll admit that you're not ashamed of it? Have ever lived in a house where snow actually come in the house? Yeah. How many of your parents or grandparents ever told you about them living there? The bad thing was in the summer, Ronnie, every now and then a snake would crawl in there and get in bed with Daddy. Daddy said, I still believe the reason I'm scared of snakes. I've woke up a few times one laying in bed with me. I said, what'd you do? He said, got out of bed. 
<laughs> My daddy, Robbie McGuire, asked him one time, Raymond, did y'all have running water? And daddy said, we sure did. Mom would say, Vernon, you and Raymond, run down there and get some water. <laughs> And they had to run all, I mean, that hits a piece from where that house is and where that spring is down underneath that. Daddy said, he said, I didn't mind plowing, didn't mind hoeing, but he said, you know what we hated in my house? I said, what? He said, wash day. And grandma washed clothes, had to carry it. And I want to tell you something about my daddy. When I was a kid, I thought he's the craziest old man I'd ever seen. He'd walk in the room and he'd hit the light switch. He'd go, thank you, Lord. Yeah. And he, he, I know what he's doing, Evelyn. He's waiting for us to say something. For years. Thank you, Lord. I thought he was glad that some burglar hadn't broke in and stole what we had. But I said, Dad, why do you do that? He said, I'm grateful for electricity. He said, man, alive. And he said, I can go in there and get me a drink of water. I'd say, Dad, I want to pop something. We ain't got no pop. There's plenty of water running out of that, that spigot. You remember that, that spigot in there? Pull that handle. It'll get you all the water you want. Never forgot, but I, com- I submit to you for those that lived, that had an intimate knowledge of my daddy, my sisters, my brother-in-law, some of my, my children, I never knew a more contented man in my life. Walter Van Hoy lived in what, a two-bedroom house, I guess most of his life. Walter had a little piece of money from time to time. We'd talk about how he was trying to save or what. Most content man I've ever met. Never well, you, it had on a pair of overalls. Most time there wasn't nothing between him and the good Lord but a pair of overalls either, was he, Eddie? But old Walter's always content. Richard Mead. Preacher Mead retired with Social Security. He retired with a military pension. His wife drove Social Security. He had a good pension, but he lived in a modest home, and he lived a very modest life, and he had an old boat he loved to catfish in. It was older than I was. He was content. My mama said one time, Raymond Humphreys, you'd be content if you just had on a clean shirt. I told her, my daddy's content if you had on a clean shirt and chewed tobacco. And for all you that uh, thinks you're going to hell for chewing tobacco, Mikey's going, but everybody else ain't going. (laughs) My daddy loved to chew some tobacco. Somebody said, Raymond, have you got a particular kind? He said, whatever kind Gary Smith's got on sale to the case. (laughs) Contentment. I would to God that I was more content and that I didn't get my britches all in a wad over some motorcycle. For all y'all that's got motorcycles, man, enjoy them. I I love them. And maybe someday I'll get one. But right now, after you just get out of the dead, don't make any sense to jump right back in. Somebody say, man, I'm getting too old to sign my name. Secondly, seek God in our gifts and talents. I've been told for years that I ought to be a stand-up comedian. And uh, might be able to do it. I done it for Valentine's Day. They had a thing called uh, Hallelujah Humor. And guess who kicked it off? The Round Mound of Ministry. And all I done is got up and told some of the stories I've told you. Went down in uh, Rogersville and uh, the old guy that, uh, what was the old guy's doc, uh, whatever his name was, used to have the traveling medicine show. Um, huh? No, I can't think what his name was. Down at Rogersville. But he died. McConnell, Doc McConnell. His little wife or daughter is now the chairman of the storytelling committee in Hawkins County, Hamlin County, and all that. My wife said, tell her one of your stories. She said, you won't be a storyteller? I said, I've thought about it. And she said, well, then you know you've got to tell them for free for a while for him by pay. I said, ma'am, I've been telling them for free 60 years. I said, I, I, I think I've paid the price. And she said, tell me a story. And I started telling her about the, the hickory nuts and the claw hammer. It's about halfway through it. She held up her hand. She said, I've heard that story, and you don't have to talk no more. You've got it. And I thought about doing that. I went and seen a guy tell stories. I didn't think no better than I was. And he got $1,500 to stand up there for 45 minutes. Yeah. But God called me to preach. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. My gift is to communicate to people. I've seen singers that was great, great singers for the Lord. And then, they, you know, Whitney Houston, there's a perfect example. How many has ever seen any of the old videos of her singing in her church? Oh, my gosh. Them folks were shouting and running aisles, and Whitney's up there belling it out. But Whitney died a miserable, miserable, miserable life. And they said last time or two she talked to some of her relatives. She said, I wish I could go back to that little country church. And sing in that choir one more time. Well, the sad thing is, Danny, 
She could have. But they wouldn't pay her $75,000 a night. She wouldn't sell $10 million worth of records a night. And when we take our gifts that God has intended to use for the body of Christ and we taint them, it is a sin far worse than most of y'all will ever realize. It is the worst. And, I, and I, there's, like I say, there's nothing wrong with being a storyteller. But nothing in my life that I do with my voice. I love to praise him and sing music. But nothing is more important to me than telling the story that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And 10,000 years from now, when everybody's forgot what the number one song was in 2017, a hundred years from now, when they've forgotten who Whitney Houston was, old Donnie boy will be running the streets of glory, shouting, Hallelujah! I'm saved. Hallelujah! I'm forevermore saved. Glory to God. That's worth more than all the riches of heaven. If the man gained the whole world, what would he give in exchange for his soul? 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and everyone may receive the things done in his body according to the hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Lastly, the most important thing we can do is seek him with all of our hearts. I've seen people that love their wife more than they love the Lord. I believe a man ought to love his wife. He'd be willing to lay down his life for her. I said, I, lo- I believe a man ought to love him. Junior, you better say this. You done got you on that other. I believe a man ought to love his wife enough to lay down his life for her. I believe a mother ought to love her children enough to give her life for them. Amen? But I want you to know, guys, that, that we'll never find Jesus if we don't seek him. Jeremiah 29 and 13 says... And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search me with all your hearts. That's not talking about sinners getting saved. That's talking about Christians getting right. Amen. Matthew 23 and 37 says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. We love a lot of things that's not the Lord. One of my favorite stories, when we won the national championship against Florida State in the Fiesta Bowl in Tempe, Arizona, uh, we had all kinds of story. We had fire and brimstone. Y'all ever heard that about fire and brimstone bill? Said when he got to heaven, he told Peter he wanted to go down and see hell. He said, why in the world do you want to see hell? He said, well, I preached about it. They called me fire and brimstone. He went down there and it wasn't nothing but an arctic thing. People froze to death. He came back up and said, I thought it was fire. He said, it used to be. Tennessee beat Florida and Alabama both this year. <laughs> <coughs> y'all get that? <coughs> But we used to tell this story, said no boy from down in Knoxville, he just working stiff, but he'd had season tickets for years at Nayland. And so when they went to uh when they went to the National Championship, he he his wife surprised him, bought him a ticket. Hey, seven, eight hundred bucks. And then he had to fly from, from Knoxville to Tempe and he'd saved and scrounged and his seat was on the last top row as far as you give the football players looked about that big. But he brought his binoculars. Old John said he's sitting up there and he got to looking and looking and there was an empty seat in the aisle, nine rows up, center section, 45-yard line, beside of an old gray-haired man. He thought, yeah, they're going to the bathroom or something. Well, at the end of the first quarter, he looked. They still ain't nobody sitting in that seat. So he can't enjoy a football game for looking at that seat. And he thinks, by the way, if somebody don't get that seat by halftime, I'm going to walk down there and see if I can sit in it. So at halftime, he walked down, that old gentleman was sitting there, and he said, is this somebody's seat? He said, well, it was, but you can have it. They're not going to be here. He said, man, a life. You know, $1,500 seat right here and all this section. He looked over at the guy, and he said, what kind of crazy person would buy a seat and not come? He said, that's my wife. It passed away, son. And he thought, man, how embarrassing. He said, didn't you have a boy that could come? He said, yeah, but he's back in Knoxville for his mama's funeral. <laughs> <laughs> now that's priorities. <laughs> that's priorities. I hope none of you is that crazy. But uh, I've been to Tennessee uh, starting '72. I've been down there every year since 1972, and except this last year. And the reason I didn't go was because Randy couldn't go. And uh, I hope to go back, but I. 
I just couldn't make myself. So we watched most of Tennessee football games on his screened-in porch. But I hope that your priorities is in better order than that. You know, you spend all your life and all your time trying to buy stuff for your kids. When kids don't spell love, M-O-N-E-Y, kids spell love, T-I-M-E. T-I-M-E. Greatest memories of my life, of my children, is laying out with Shanna, looking at stars. Shanna, baby, every clear night, every clear night that your daddy walks out on the porch, we live out in the sticks, ain't no street lights, ain't no nothing. And when I look up and see those stars, first thing that enters my mind is thank you, Jesus, for being mindful of me. And the next thing is me and Shanna laying on that quilt. We had a hill on our house that laid just right, and Shannon was the only young and I had that had any interest in stars and stuff. And I, as a Boy Scout, knowed all the constellations and stuff. And we'd sit out, and she'd go, "There's a satellite, Daddy!" And there go a satellite. That's an airplane. Shannon, how old are you now? Yeah, honey, I ain't got time to figure birthdays. I just, do you know? <laughs> Well, you was born in 1980, July the 14th. I know that. Ever how many years? She'll be 37. That's been 30 years ago, and I still remember that. I'm sure I bought her some nice stuff and stuff through the years that she remembered, but that's my memory. My boy Matthew, watching him a little short legs around first base going to second. Matthew slid if the ball was still in outfield or if it was no matter where it was, Matthew slid. Son, he loved to slide. He'd come digging in there in the center field, just relaying the ball. Old Matthew would slide. Had that little slide down pat, he'd hit that base and pop up so cocky. <laughs> but I still remember that. And George, you remember them three boys, yours, all three of them playing ball. You were coaching them, and I was coaching him. Greatest days of my life. You cannot replace time. You can replace a car fender. You can replace a diamond ring, but you can't ever replace time. Best memory of my oldest daughter, when she was 16 year old, her little boyfriend broke up with her and she was crying. And I had a pretty good idea why he broke up with her. Anybody know what I'm talking about? What he wanted to do and what she said she was going to do. Anybody with me? So he decided that... Sissy Goodbody was a lot more into that thing, and he dropped my little girl. You ever wanted to whoop a 16-year-old boy? I wanted to whoop a 9-year-old one time for bullying my boy. But I came in, Cheryl said, she's downstairs crying. So-and-so broke up with her. She had a mouthful of braces and uh, had her hair up in pigtails. And when her little eyes was about swell shut, I scooted in bed beside her and she laid her head on my chest and she said these words, Daddy, you've always been honest. Have you ever lied to me? I said, no, baby, I've never lied to you. Why? She said, am I ugly? Am I ugly, Daddy? I said, no, baby. I said, you're beautiful. And I said, one of these days, God's going to send you a man. And he sent her Mike Carver. And I know of no couple in the world that's any more in love than my daughter and her husband. I know of no man that's any better. Billy's is the same way. But I mean, for 20 years, Mike has took care of... Matter of fact, I aggravate him sometimes about where his man card is. (laughs) But that's time. That's time. Eddie, when your boy is 60 year old, He'll still remember. He'll still remind, remember riding that old truck going up in that holler at that farm, to that old cabin, and staying with his daddy. Janice, he'll remember what you cooked for him when he was hungry when he got in from school. They never forget. Elizabeth, remember that first set of golf clubs you bought her? She played with, and you well, got in that old golf cart and followed her all around the golf course. And this pastor will remember every time you ever said, "I prayed for you." I love you, preacher. Good job, preacher. 
Hang in there, preacher. We love you, preacher. Have the time and the priority to say or do what's right. What is my priorities? Look at your checkbook. You'll know. Look at your schedule. What do you spend your time with? What do you find yourself daydreaming about or thinking about? How much time do you spend in the Bible compared to the time you spend online? How, many, how much time do you spend praying compared to how much time you spend playing some kind of video game or solitaire or something? It ain't hard to find your priority. Let me close with this. What happens when we seek Jesus first? You might want to jot these down. They're very important, seven of them, but I'm not going to preach. I'm just going to tell them to you. What happens, and I'm preaching this out of both experientially and theologically. It's what the Word teaches us, and this is what I've experienced. Uh, Like I say, this is not something I'm telling you about what Dr. So-and-so said. This is something I have lived. Guys, I'm not always in God's will. I just told you about buying a a uh, Dinah lowrider that I wanted so badly. And I could have, you know what I actually thought about pouting with Sharon? We don't fuss. We both pout. <laughs> I go outside and pout. She goes in the living room and pouts. Good thing is it lasts somewhere between seven to ten minutes. I'll say, I'm sorry, me too, but you are hateful. <laughs> guilty <laughs> but I get out of God's will but Danny and I don't mean this in no bad way I'm, Eddie I'm thanking God for this I've been in God's will a bunch too and let me tell you what I found out the scripture teaches I, I, I backed it up with the word number one we see people saved when we're really seeking him we'll come up on people we'll run into people we'll meet people family members will be primed Danny Fire got a job right below his sister's house on the other end of this county, and he'd stop in there every day and see his sister. Guess what happened? She got saved. She got saved. When we're doing God's will, we'll see people saved. Number two, we'll get our mind off of life's struggles and on to heaven's rewards. I want to say something about a lady I never met but three times in my life. What was your mama's first name, Mike? Trout, what was your mom's name? Bertha Trout. Lived in a very modest home, but I don't know that I've ever seen anybody any more contented or happy in my life. We was up to the hospital visiting May Stanley. Mike called and he said, Mama, the preacher's with me, and uh, you, can you scurry up something to eat? Well, this was 11 o'clock. And I could hear her on the phone, Lord, how mercy, Michael, you bringing that preacher up here. And she said, I'll throw something together. We went up there. She had steak and gravy, mashed potatoes, biscuits, cornbread. She had soup, beans, fried, had all kinds of stuff. She said, preacher, it's just rough eating. And I said, I'm a rough eater. <laughs> and Mike, I mean this from the depths of my heart. That woman was as happy being able to watch us eat and cook that meal as we were eating it. Am I telling the truth? That's what happens. You got you see priorities. Janice, I know this of you. Hazel, I know this of you. Priorities is wanting to give an opportunity to give, not take. Amen. Our society says, I deserve this. You deserve hell. I deserve hell. I'm telling you, this ain't a shouting message, but it's a good one. It sure is fine. It's got into the quick of some of you soul. I can feel it. It sure got me. It killed me when I was preaching. I had to get up here and testify about my motorcycle. That it wasn't because of sharing. It was because God said, you don't blow money. Thirdly, quit looking at everybody else's faults and look at God's majesty. The most discouraged I have ever been. Glenn Dye told me 30 years ago, me and him and Danny was on visitation and I said something and he said, Donnie, I've been to rededicate my life. And I didn't know why. You know, Duda is always pretty straight liver, and, and me and Danny, we didn't, we didn't ask him why, but he told us. He said, boys, I got my mind, I mean, my eyes on other people, and coming one day, he totally backsliding. He said, I sat back there in that sound room, and he said, I'm looking out over people, and he said, preacher preaching his guts out, and people fisting and gooshing and punching one another, and like, he said, I'm talking about grown adults. 
And they sitting in sometimes open that little window so I can hear some of the stuff they saying. And, and, and they church members. So he said, I just started shutting my window. And he said, I look over the top of everybody's heads and I look straight at Paul or whoever's up there saying, you remember that, Danny? Dude, I was going on to be with the Lord. Loved that man. I'm telling you, one of the funniest human beings I've ever been. He'd get tickled and he'd go, yeah, yeah. And you could hear him for a half a mile. I got him tickled one time in church and there had been some embarrassed in my life. We was in revival and I said something. He went, yeah, yeah. Preacher thought he was shouting and went, yes, sir. <laughs> And he started doing it worse. <laughs> but you'll fire so much better when you get your eyes off of other people's problems and get your eyes on Jesus. For a young Christian, my friend Eddie Van Hoy is one of the strongest people I've ever met for that. Several times playing golf, I'd be so aggravated stuff, and he'd say, I've been thinking the same thing, but I've been a praying hard for him. That's scriptural. You remember that song that the primitive quartet used to have? When my faults and failures you see, my brother, don't go tell another. Go and tell Jesus on me. When my faults and failures you see, my brother, please don't go tell another. Go and tell Jesus on me. That's what I want you to do for me. Alan, I don't want you to talk ugly about me, so why do I want to talk ugly about you? Huh? Billy, I don't want to second guess everything. I don't want you to second guess everything I do, and I'm not going to second guess everything you do. You see, it's easy to sit in this congregation and find fault with the one round mound of ministry standing up there by his bad self. You ought to try this. When I first started, I thought I was going to please people. I have long since abandoned that, that concept. Stop, number four, stop worrying. Yep. Amen. Dear Lord, I see people. Honest to goodness, I look at some of y'all when you come into church. Good people. People that live right. People that do right. But you look like a dead lice has fallen off of you. Mama said one time, Raymond, all right, Sandra, am I telling the truth? You remember when she, asked, she got upset because he wasn't worrying? You remember that? Mama said, Raymond, I'm worried about such and such. Are you? And Daddy said, no, Mama, I'm not. She said, that worries me. <laughs> Did you get that? My mama wasn't only worried about the problem. She worried that my daddy wasn't worried about the problem. My mama's dead and gone, but she lived her entire life worried about what somebody thought about her. Mama said one time about something. She said, I hope people don't think you think so. And then she, when she got in, I didn't know what she's talking about. I said, what? She said something. You said, son, he said, I hope people don't think you think you know what you think. Yourself. I said, mama, I can't have control what I think, much less worry about what other people think about what I think. Dear God, you can run yourself crazy with old stuff like that. Quit worrying. If somebody called me today and said the house is on fire, I'd run over there, but I wouldn't sit around the next 20 years going, I, I was doing what I was going to do. I've heard that. <laughs> We've got it insured for about $40,000 more than it's worth. Oh, Lord, it'll burn down. <laughs> 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 I, I, I guarantee you. You know what Brother Donnie said up there the other day? People said, <laughs> tell you the most I ever had to repent when Steve Grindstice's castle caught on fire. You remember that? How many members that? Now let's, let's see how many's on us. How many thought his insurance job? Raise your hand. I did too till I got over and seen lightning and struck poor feller's house. I felt like going over to Grindstice, whatever he's got, and say, man, I'm sorry. Quit worrying. Number five, peace replaces fear and worry. When you got the peace of God that passes us all understanding that other stuff has to go. Number six, be grateful for what you do have. I sold my life's motorcycle. I didn't I had a new Monte Carlo SS and y'all know I went through a horrible financial thing. Sold my truck and bought an old junk truck so I could work. 
Sold my Monte Carlo and bought a Pontiac Bonneville, 175,000 miles, and sold my motorcycle. My motorcycle. Wayne, there's a difference in motorcycle and your motorcycle. I had every piece of chrome one could put on it and all kinds of little fancy paint and doodads. And, man, I looked like a gypsy salesman coming down the road. That old boy backed in here. I put it on. I said, here's the deal. I'm going to put it on trading post. If it don't try to sell one month, I'll know it's not God's will for me to sell it. The paper come out, and about an hour later, a guy called and bought it. <laughs> he backed that trailer in. My office was right over there then, and I rode that motorcycle up on her, put the kickstand down, helped him, and I sat in my office and cried like a baby while it went out of this parking lot. That's a God's truth thought of all the work and how I'd done all the places I'd been, all the guys I'd rode with. And I said, God, what have I done to make you so mad? What, what have I done that every time I turn around, I lose something that's took away from me? What, what, what have I done? Didn't hear a thing. And then I said, here's what I said. I said, God, I don't have my car no more. I don't have my motorcycle. And in mid-sentence, First, here's what he said, mid-sentence. God said, you do still have both your feet. You do still have both your legs. You got both your hands. And I can live with that. I just enjoy watching others ride theirs. I'm content. And then lastly... Look at life on what can I give, not what can I get. Teresa, come if you will. Praise team, come quietly as you possibly can. If you're here today and you don't have contentment, if you're here today and don't have peace, I'll tell you where you can't find it. You can't find it in a bottle of Jack Daniels. You can't find it in a carton of beer. You can't find it in a joint. You can't find it in meth. You can't find it in painkillers or muscle relaxers or any other prescription drug. You can't find it with sleeping with everybody that will sleep with you. You can't find it in pornography and fantasy life. You can't find it in anger and bitterness. You can't find it in any of those things. You'll find it in Christ, in Christ alone. There's temporary peace in the bottom of a liquor bottle. There's temporary peace in smoking a joint. There's temporary excitement and thrill in illicit sex. But the Bible said that when sin is done, it brings forth death. You look at these people, these country music stars and rock and roll stars and movie stars, the happiest people you've ever seen in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s stars. And then no matter how many times they've had stuff nipped and tucked and cut, sooner or later gravity is going to catch up. And you start getting these 90-year-old women look like a bee stung them in both lips. We had a woman here one time that had Botox, and Janice Light knows I'm telling the truth. My mama started toward and I said, what are you going to do? She said, that poor little hunt young has had a bee sting her, had some kind of rela- uh, reaction. It sounded my telling the truth. I grabbed her and I said, for God's sake, Paul, get over here. <laughs> Look at her. You can have implants, raise up whatever you want. And I think people say cancer and stuff. I'd, I'd encourage you to do that if it makes you feel good about yourself again. But guys, none of that stuff will bring peace. I have troubles. I have trials. But honest to goodness, 95% of the time I have the peace of God. Occasionally something will knock me down. You know, y'all, y'all can't imagine. That. Ask these deacons. You can't imagine the stuff that a pastor of church this size. The bad stuff I have to hear. But I get enough of them phone calls. Hey, Brother Donnie, my sister in Baltimore got saved. You know what I despise? I despise to tell somebody from another church, oh, Johnny got saved. Is that right? Man, if they get saved at Piney Grove, they get saved over there. And I'm going to tell you something about Ansel Jr. 
called the other day and said, how's your attendance today? I said, it was awful, brother. The flu's killed us. But thank God we had two saved. He said, well, glory. And he meant it, Danny. He said, we ain't had nobody saved in a few weeks. I said, let's keep praying. Bow your heads. Close your eyes just briefly. Pastor, honey, I want that peace. I, I don't have no peace in my life. It ain't nobody's business. Mine, yours. Praise team's praying. Teresa's looking at the piano. Uh, the guys up in the balcony's not looking. Would you please raise your hand and pray for it? I need peace. Yes. 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 Someone else. Yes. 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 I need peace. I need peace. I have no peace. I have no peace. Holly. Holly, pray for you, Anybody else like to come? I need peace. I need peace. Anybody else? Brother Donnie, I need salvation. I've never been saved. Would you pray for me? Anybody? Father, please, please, please help those that's thirsty to come drink out of the fountain. Help those that are hungry to come eat from the bounty that you have provided. Help those that are wounded to come to the palm of Gilead. Help those that are lonely to come to a friend that sticketh closer to a brother. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. As we stand our feet, would you come? Would you come right now?